Hello, I'm Jordan Juckstock, here on behalf of my co-authors to present our work toward realistic and reproducible web crawl measurements. This work was done at North Carolina State University in concert with privacy researchers from Brave Software. Our general goal was to assess and improve the generalizability of web measurements to the end user experience, since a lack of such generalization makes it very hard to produce actionable web security or web privacy research. Our specific contribution in this large and currently active space is to assess the impact of crawl realism factors. We use and assess a variety of representative vantage points and browser configurations in our test crawls and in assessing the results that we get we find measurable and consistent bias in HTTP traffic distribution and some JavaScript content behaviors. Our motivating concerns here uh, began with client-side bot detection. In a previous web measurement work uh, evaluating the visible V8 JavaScript instrumentation framework, we observed client-side bot detection to be present on at least 29% of the Alexa top 50k domains. The providers engaging in this behavior clearly weren't doing so for their own health. Um, they were setting themselves up in, to be in a position in which they could engage in invas evasive or adversarial responses that could skew measurement results, whatever their intentions, whether benign or, or adversarial. And compounding this, we were aware of the phenomenon of network-based cloaking of web content, typically associated with malware or malvertising, but nothing would prevent a benign content provider from using similar techniques to mask um, content that they considered um, sensitive or valuable from clients that they considered uh, unworthy. And this could similarly affect the uh, accuracy of web measurement. These realism concerns are compounded by the generally acknowledged poor reproducibility of web crawl experiment setups. A recent web conference publication found that over the past five years, 16% of top security and, re and privacy research papers within top venues used web crawl measurement data in forming their conclusions, but over one third of those did not even name the tools that they were using. So when we set about designing and documenting for reproducibility our experiment, we used a realism matrix in two axes. The first axis, axis being vantage point, where what kind of network the request will originate from. We used three representative networks, our own research university network, um, a popular cloud provider, Amazon AWS, at the nearest available data center, and a local residential ISP, which of course we expected to be the most realistic uh, vantage point. A concern that would rise at this moment is that uh, US East 1 is not physically located in the same place as NCSU in Raleigh, North Carolina. Fortunately, our results uh, seem to be clear enough that we don't need to be worried about uh, confounding factors in geotargeting, but I'll, I'll say more on that later. The other axis of our realism matrix was browser configuration, or what kind of user agent we were using, and how realistic it appeared, how much like a, a real end user sitting at a desktop browser. Our two configurations were based on the same foundation, uh, Chromium automated by Puppeteer, but one made no attempt to mask its um, automation and was running in headless mode, that's our naive browser configuration. The other was using a full instance of Chrome, not in headless mode, and took advantage of a stealth plugin for Puppeteer developed by a community of web scraping enthusiasts who are unsatisfied with um, the results they get from more naive crawlers. The advantage that this approach gives us is that we can compare the results from our naive and our stealthy crawler and gain some insights into how they would compare against a real user in the following way. Um, consider this thought experiment. A real user visiting a range of websites would presumably, ideally, not be classified as a bot on any of them. They would get the intended end user targeted content. A naive crawler would be flagged as a bot on some unknown number of these websites in which case it could be detected by a different response coming back to the crawler. Our stealthy crawler, hardened by the various techniques we've described, might still be detected on some unknown number of websites, but on some of the websites that the naive crawler would be classified as a bot and either blocked or given some different content, the stealthy crawler would be treated effectively as an end user. And these differences across this unknown but presumably non-zero 
uh, subset of websites gives us a baseline, a lower bound against which we can reason and say, well, if we see this much difference between these two fairly similar browser configurations, um, the difference between these bots and a real end user must be at least this dramatic. Therefore, with our realism matrix filled in, we have six combinations of options for each URL we visit. The URLs we visit are the landing pages of the Tranco Top 25K domains. We visit them in three uh, independent crawls in randomized order using a somewhat complex setup that we describe in the paper and I will not take time to talk about here. The most important factor um, of our experiment design that I will stress here is how much work we put into making uniform the client uh, side uh, runtime environment because if, if we allow client differences to inject noise into our data then we will not be able to assess the actual impact of the vantage point or the browser config. We can't control what happens on the server side but we can control how uniform the clients are and we make every effort to do that here. We make sure that we launch all the crawls, um, all the visits to the same uh, URL within a very tight time window, uh, on average less than 100 millisecond launch window. We use the same DNS servers for all endpoints no matter what network they were in. We lock down compute and network resources to the lowest common denominators in terms of bandwidth and latency and available CPU and memory so that no one configuration is able to run away from the other simply because of available resources. And we use tricks from the Google Catapult project to render uniform sources of entropy available to JavaScript such as random number generation or the time of day functions. We capture the typical artifacts, um, specifically HTTP metadata for requests and some JavaScript activity. There is not time to address every finding that we document in the paper here in this presentation, but I will go through a full drill down of our most fundamental HTTP traffic analysis results, starting with all third-party HTTP requests and their distribution across all domains, and then looking at how that is varying across vantage point and browser configuration using a bias score heuristic we develop in the paper to find outliers. We then take a subset of the traffic that is of most interest to security and privacy researchers relating to advertising and user tracking and look at the biases, particularly browser configuration biases that are apparent there, and then do a further analysis of that subset by looking at where in the page context, HTML frame context, the requests are originating from. If we look at all HTTP requests to third party domains, and plot it, and plot those distributions, uh, looking at each of our realism factors, we do not see dramatic, um, obvious, high-level differences. But we do see some subtle differences in the curves and the plots, and this raises a question of how we can analyze what is causing those, find these outliers, and determine whether they are interesting or significant. The tool that we develop in the paper to do this is what we call our bias score calculation. For a given data point, say requests to a particular third-party domain, we compare two observations, observation A and B, and we do so using base two logarithms and some rounding to give ourselves integer scores, where zero means they're within the same order of magnitude, and positive or minus scores indicate that one side or the other is significantly larger than the other. Of course, this is easy to generate large scores if one side is simply missing. Um, so to avoid this uh, sort of an out effect, we subject all of our scores to a consistency filter. We compute scores for each data point from the data from all three experiments independently, and then taking those three scores, we eliminate all the data points that did not have three complete scores, in other words, that were present only on one or two uh, experiments, and we use the median of the three scores that we have as the synthetic score for distributions and other analysis. We also can use this to score the consistency of each data point from 0 to 1.0 based on how many distinct uh, score values we got. We can then plot these distributions visually. So in this case, we are looking at the distribution of bias scores from HTTP requests to third-party domains broken down across browser configuration, stealthy versus naive. And we're going to use this color coding for the rest of our plots where the gray numbers indicate the great silent majority of domains or other data points in the middle which do not show a consistent bias one way or the other. The pink wing of the plot will represent data points for which more realistic clients got more engagement or more traffic. 
and the pink wing those data points for which less realistic clients got more traffic. In this case, we see the great majority of domains, almost 93%, um, accounting for the majority of traffic, over 94%, do not show uh, any consistent bias, and these numbers are extremely stable. So we do have a great middle mass of data that does not show bias. But we do find um, biased domains out on each side, and it's mostly symmetric, a little bit more consistent on the realistic side, but in terms of domain share and traffic share, mostly symmetric. We will come back to this uh, symmetry effect later, but first, uh, a look at the vantage point um, bias within that aggregate overall traffic distribution. It's the same data we're looking at, but now broken down by vantage point. It's a busier graph because we now have um, three um, items to compare instead of two, so that means three head-to-head -head comparison curves. The majority of these data points still do not show bias. There is now a significant um, asymmetry in what bias we do see, and it is asymmetry against the cloud endpoint. The cloud endpoint um, has fewer data points which favor it versus the residential or universal uh, university uh, vantage point. Excuse me. These realistic or anti-cloud um, data points are also more consistent in their scores uh, than their counterparts, and this asymmetry is important to us because one of the concerns we had going into our vantage point assessment was the effect to which geotargeting of ads might inject noise into our measurements. Now surely there is some of that here. Surely some of these data points are in the, the left or the right wing because they were running ads that simply were not targeted at uh, one of our physical locations. But it uh, strains credulity to think that targeted advertising in general is two to three times more popular in Wake County North Carolina than in Fairfax County, Virginia. So we believe that we are seeing a legitimate anti-cloud bias on display here. Not all traffic is created equal. The traffic that is of most interest typically to security and privacy researchers is that that involves user privacy, advertising, user tracking. So we apply popular filter lists, um, the easy list and easy privacy lists concurrent with our experiment dates. And that accounts for about 33% of all of our traffic is flagged as advertising or, or tracking traffic by these lists. And then when we look at browser configuration bias within this traffic, we see a significant amount of it. 19% of the domains that we are considering show traffic bias across browser configuration. What is interesting is that it is mostly symmetric. There is an increase in uh, the realistic side but it is mostly symmetric. When we continue to drill down into the data to assess why domains, I mean, it makes sense that domains would favor a more realistic client, but why domains would spend more time with an unrealistic client is not immediately apparent. When we drill down a little further by frame context, whether um, these requests are coming from code or elements inside the mainframe or inside subframes, we see an interesting phenomenon. 57% of all this advertising traffic is coming from the main frame. Uh, lesser shares from first party and third party subframes. The third party subframes are not significantly different from the first party subframes, so we don't consider them separately here. We now see a significant pro-realism or pro-stealthy bias in the mainframe context, um, specifically in the traffic share, almost eight to one in the traffic share. And we see an extreme opposite bias, a pro-naive or unrealistic client bias. Uh, in the subframe context, and particularly this is the first time we begin to see very popular domains like Google show up in uh, the blue side of these plots. We hypothesize in the paper this may be related to anti-bot de detection uh, and de anti-bot defenses. Uh, we believe more work is required in this space to know for sure. Takeaways for researchers in this space are that vantage point and browser configuration choice can affect your results significantly. We believe our numbers are actually probably lower bounds for reasons we elaborate on in the paper. If you can, avoid va cloud vantage points, though in fairness, vantage point probably has less realism than browser configuration. The browser configurations to avoid are certainly headless browsers and anything else that's easily or frequently tagged as an automated bot in the wild. We believe crawler realism research needs to improve. This is um, an area of future work for us and for other researchers who want accurate measurements.
That concludes my remarks. I thank you for your time and attention. I refer you to the paper and our released code and data for further information.